Good evening, and thank you for joining us for our virtual book talk with Elizabeth Outka and Sarah Cole, who will be discussing Sarah, uh, sorry, Elizabeth Outka's latest book, Viral Modernism, The Influenza Pandemic and in Interwar Literature, published by Columbia University Press. My name is Joelle Tubé. I'm the communications officer for Columbia Global Centers Paris. And for those of you who don't know about us, Columbia Global Centers Paris is part of a network of centers established by Columbia University to work with students, faculty, and local partners in creating opportunities for shared learning, research, and engaged dialogue. And we are located at Reed Hall in the Montparnasse neighborhood of Paris. And in addition to hosting international undergraduate and graduate programs, we also organize lecture series, workshops, concerts, and artistic performances, many of which are online at the moment. Um, our event tonight is presented in partnership with Columbia University Press, Synapsis, a health humanities journal, the Institute for Ideas and Imagination, which is also located at Reed Hall, the Alliance Program, the Columbia Maison Française, and Columbia Libraries. And before we begin, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Elizabeth Outka and Sarah Cole, and I'll briefly introduce them. Elizabeth Outka is Professor of English at the University of Richmond, where she teaches modernism and contemporary literature. And in addition to tonight's book, Viral Modernism, she is the author of Consuming Traditions, Modernity, Modernism, and the Commodified Authentic, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2009. Her essays have appeared in journals, Modernism, Modernity, Novel, Contemporary Literature, The Paris Review Daily, and many edited collections. She is the recipient of numerous awards and grants, including a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Sarah Cole is Par Professor of English and Comparative Literature and Dean of Humanities at Columbia University. A specialist in literary modernism, she is the co-founder of the NYNJ Modernism Seminar and director of the Humanities War and Peace Initiative at Columbia. She's the author of three books um, and most recently Inventing Tomorrow, H.G. Wells and the 20th Century, which was also published by Columbia University Press last year and which she presented actually at our center just before we closed uh, due to the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, she's published articles in journals such as PMLA, Modernism and Modernity, Modernist Cultures, Modern Fiction Studies, and in edited collections, and she's the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. And finally, um, just a quick note on the format of this event. This is an interactive event. Uh, the book discussion will be followed by a 15 to 20 minute Q&A session. And if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A box. You'll see it at the bottom of your, your Zoom screen. And you can submit a question at any time uh, during the talk. Um, and now I will hand it over to Sarah Cole. Thank you both for being with us tonight. Thank you, uh, Joelle, and to the Columbia Global Centers. I'm so happy um, to be here to talk, about, to talk with Elizabeth about her wonderful new book, Viral Modernism. Um, it's not the first time I've read it, but going back over it these last few days has been just such a pleasure. Um, it's a difficult topic and we'll talk about its unbelievable um, relevance right now, I hope in a few minutes, but it's a, it's a work of tremendous uh, research, um, years of research, reading and archives, reading letters and diary entries and books that no one else has read since. Um, and of deep um, learning and thinking about more uh, widely known writers and artists and texts from this period. So it's a really great book um, and I'm, I'm so happy to be part of a discussion of it today or this evening, I guess, in Paris. Um, I'm in New York, so it's the middle of the day and it's hot and sunny out, so multiple temporalities. Um, so Elizabeth, you and I are both literary critics. We work on literary modernism, which is, you know, for the listeners who are not totally um, into these categories, is the literature of the first 50 years or so of the 20th century, give or take some of the 19th, um, and tends to, um, tends to come with particular assumptions about what we mean by that. It's a certain kind of writing, not only a, a, a literary period. Um, and your book just makes a huge contribution to the study of literary modernism and to 
the kind of critical um, world of literary studies more generally. Um, and I can say that, you know, as someone who's been working in this field for a long time, the question of where is the flu in modernism has been something that has sort of hovered uh, in my mind for many, many years, as I know it has for many others. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I learned you were writing this book and began to um, hear pieces of it and now to see it in its complete form, the, the feeling that has always been so strong is, of course, we need this book. Where has this book been all my life? Um, and here it is. Um, so it's a really great question and one that I want to, you know, hopefully hear about from you today, or I, I know we all do, um, and to think about sort of what you discovered and how you um, came to find the flu in modernism and, and where, where we want to go with that. Um, but I think we have to start with the elephant in the room, um, which is um, the fact that this is a book about the flu pandemic of 1918-19. Um, and it's really uncanny that this has all uh, happened just as your book was coming out. It's obviously a horrible thing that it's happened, um, but at least we can say that we can look to this book in a new way. Um, there are so many um, differences um, that one notices, but also of course the similarities really strike us. There's a, an amazing set of photographs in your introduction. By the way, the introduction is a tour de force. I, I couldn't recommend it high, highly enough as a, an example of how to do a historical literary introduction that grips the reader. Um, but you have a number of photographs, including one of all these policemen with masks on. And I remember that used to feel like the weirdest mm -hmm. photograph. Um, and now it feels like what we see every day. So um, I guess what I wanted to do is start by asking, how have you experienced all of this? Um, and you know, how do you see um, the 1918 and 19 flu and your work on it, what you've learned about it um, as part of this discourse or not part of this discourse? And what is what is your work done to help you and to help all of us think about the moment um, that we're in? And, and how can thinking about the stuff that you have been so immersed in over these last years help us to understand where we are now and contribute to the public discourse? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for the thoughts on the book and um, and for um, for that introduction. It's been a very weird experience. Um, the the book did it came out in October, um, right around the time the the virus was just starting to um, to emerge. Not that we had heard anything about it um, at that uh, at that point, or or really anyone knew knowing about it. But the the it's a, I described it to somebody as sort of being in, uh, waking up and finding you're stuck in some sort of B movie um, where, you know, an author has written a book and, uh, and they wake up and suddenly they're in that world of the book, you know, and uh, it, it wouldn't be a very good movie. Um, but it's, uh, it's been strange. Um, there is so many overlaps between the two, ex the, between the two pandemics. Um, certainly the, the public life, sort of what the public, sort of what things look like in the streets. Uh, Sarah mentioned the, the masks were everywhere, the, um, the sense of the deserted streets that's, you know, not as, as prominent um, right now, but certainly in the early days of the pandemic, um, the, uh, the terrible body sort of problems that, uh, that pandemics um, uh, bring, the overwork of the doctors, sort of what things looked like um, on the streets, I think were, it, it, there, there's a lot of parallel. Um, schools closed, businesses closed, uh, fights about how soon to open, um, what sort of caseloads you had to have, um, all of these things really parallel, um, uh, offer a distinct parallel, as well as the emotions. Um, and that's something that really, I think that in addition to the uncanny way that um, suddenly my world looked so much like the world that I had researched. Um, emotionally, there were a lot of parallels as well, right? The authors talk so much about the time, the sort of sense of time being um, altered or scrambled or split into a before and an after, um, and the slipperiness of time, the way time didn't have traction in the same, um, in the same way. And, uh, and I think the contagion guilt, right, the fears um, that were everywhere when you have an invisible enemy in the air, 
as well as this, uh, this terrible sense of guilt that you could bring the virus um, to somebody um, uh, without obviously meaning to. Though there's, a, there's also, I've been struck by the distinct differences between the two. And I think that the two that I would really point to would be the way that the influenza pandemic came at the tail end of World War I, of course. Um, and, uh, and so the way it was remembered and the way that it was um, somehow greeted and treated really was filtered in 1918, 1919 through the war, right? People had spent four and a half years fighting this terror, the worst war uh, in terms of casualties anybody had seen up until that point. And the flu seemed like some sort of weird afterthought, some sort of cruel cosmic joke. And, uh, and people really couldn't take it in. And I think that that's part of why the flu is not so prominent in cultural memory. Um, and then the second thing is the, is the populations, right? The, um, the, the, the 1918 flu, um, everybody caught it, um, but um, it killed young adults in extremely high numbers. Um, so between the ages of 20 and 40, and especially between the ages of 20 and 30. And obviously we're seeing a very different um, uh, sort of mortality curve uh, with, uh, with COVID. Um, and then the only other thing I would add to the parallels is the, uh, the way both pandemics really highlighted some of the inequalities um, of the cultures, uh, of the societies, the um, uh, access to health care, um, existing health conditions, um, a whole range of things were, uh, uh, were exacerbated by these, uh, by these two flus. Well, yeah, by these two I, pandemics. I was really struck by that too in rereading your introduction, that um, emphasis on the inequities that on the one hand you describe, I think rightly, a sense of the indiscriminateness of the virus and yeah, and that's really how I think many of us felt about this at the beginning. And then we find it isn't indiscriminate, it's discriminate, it's discriminatory in a sense even. So I was really um, interested in that. So your book is both a book about the flu and it's a book about how the flu finds, how the flu not just finds its way into literature, that's too passive, but sort of how literary writers and other artists actually, um, work to figure out what to do with the flu and, and where it shows up, how their works express, I guess is the word I'm looking for, the situation. And I want to talk in a lot of, I hope, you know, some detail about some of your um, arguments and some of the things you find there. Um, but the first point I want to make, and, I, and sticking with the present just for a moment, is that you do um, make the case, which is undeniable, that it's not very visible at first look or second or third. <laughs> Um, it's really invisible. And you said in your opening remarks that people just couldn't take it after the war. Um, and I want to talk more about the war and some of that in a minute. But I guess my first question about that is, do you expect, I mean, you're not expected to be predicting the shape of literature, but does it seem to you likely that this pandemic would disappear from our sort of sense of our what we're supposed to be doing with our cultural artifacts in the way it clearly did after uh, the, the 1918 pandemic? Or do you envision artists and writers and architects and others kind of taking this on in a more overt manner? Yeah, I, my prediction would be that it would be much more overt um, and, uh, and, and dealt with more directly and that we will all remember it. Um, I, it, it Everybody remembered the 1918 pandemic. Um, uh, that's something that's very striking, um, but but it didn't work its way into the into the culture in quite the way we might have expected, given the given the scope of the losses um, uh, in the in the pandemic, um, which were in you know the United States more than all of the 20th and 21st century wars combined in terms of the in terms of the death rates it was it was different in Britain um, and in France but um, but I do expect it to show up um, across a range of artworks um, and and one of the things I think that the modernists do so well and um, and that I would expect the arts to do well here 
is to simultaneously record the impact of it as well as the way it was ambiguous and hard to deal with um, because of the invisibility of the threat, right? That sort of part of the representation has to be a kind of grappling with how difficult this is to grapple with. Um, and I think that the other thing that it will happen is uh, I believe mean, there's a lot of delayed grieving that is happening right now, right? Um, and this was true in the flu that there was no uh, funerals are disrupted, the ways that we mark death are disrupted. And in the aftermath of the war, of course, there's a huge um, sort of push to memorialize. And I think that that, that effort sort of helped some people in the, you, you know, in the flu uh, aftermath to process some of that grief. But I think we're going to need more direct memorials for this um, to the pandemic to help people through art, um, through visible public sort of displays to, to help people through the massive amount of grief that's happening right now, but not getting sort of processed. Um, so I think we'll see, um, I think we'll see that. Um, um, I hope so. I mean, one of the things that was so moving to me as COVID hit was how helpful the literature that I had studied was for my own sort of sense of structure and uh, and well-being and the way that it helped me kind of process all of the things that were happening. And I think we will need the art um, going forward to, to, to represent and to protest and to um, and to somehow kind of come to grips with all that this might um, mean for, um, for, for our psyches and for our cultures. Yeah, I mean, those are such moving uh, answers. And I was thinking as you were speaking at the end there about my colleague, Carol Becker, who's the Dean of the School of the Arts, and she's written a little bit about how sort of what happens in a pause, which she's thinking about artists mostly, but really any of us. And, you know, it is true that, you know, there, there was a lot that was said at the time, you know, where people are just binge watching Game of Thrones, or maybe they're that was me. Um, maybe there are there are you know people who are using this time off in a in a more sort of aesthetically or intellectually or culturally generative way um, or some combination. But I think that sense that it takes time to grieve. I mean, I've been very moved by the New York Times as um, those that we lost um, obituaries or writing obituaries of people who they would not otherwise write obituaries of from the pandemic. It's very incomplete, of course. It's very tiny compared to the numbers. But I think the sense that grieving is part of this, that doesn't feel as much like we're in that moment. And so I think you're right that that's a really important parallel um, to keep in mind. Um, maybe we should talk about the war now. I mean, there's, there's so much to say about your work in the book, but in a way, the, the alter ego of the pandemic for you is, of course, World War I, um, as your, our listeners, viewers, uh, are these invisible people, <laughs> speaking of invisibility, uh, uh, no, World War I was fought and ended right at the, I mean, the, the, the first wave of the pandemic actually happened before the end of World War I, and as you note in your introduction, these are not totally um, uh, coincidental that the conditions of mobility and of people being gathered in camps and so on may have been part of what allowed the flu to uh, spread in the first place. Um, but it was also the event that as you sort of reckon with throughout your book kind of steals the limelight from the pandemic. Um, and that's for a lot of reasons. And I, one of the things I thought was so, I find so um, powerful about your book is that you kind of itemize how and why that happens. What did the war have that the pandemic did or what did the war do to the pandemic? And then in your readings, you kind of work these out together. So I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about these two events and sort of, again, thinking about the literary output and the kind of cultural, uh, the kind of later years and decades and even much later kind of critical traditions that have enshrined the war in certain ways. And, you know, how do you see, what, what are you thinking about or what do you want to share about these two events together? You call them twinned tragedies. And I, I thought that was, you have a lot of language for how to think about them together. Yes. 
So there's certainly a lot of, um, of overlap um, in terms of the, I mean, these are two mass death events. Um, they are two events that, um, that produce um, uh, bodies that, um, th th these are not individual events, right? That these are, these, they, they produce bodies that are, that are, that are stacked, right, um, uh, up. They both uh, did terrible damage to the body. Um, the flu was a particularly virulent form. It was extremely bloody. Um, it destroyed the lungs in ways that were uncannily similar to poison gas, right? So that there was a, there was a real um, sort of visible damage um, to the bodies. Um, and, uh, um, but in terms of, um, I, and they and they were right. They 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 overlapped. Um, they overlapped each other, and uh, and a lot of people, especially in in Britain, got um, and in France actually, um, uh, they um, they uh, in armistice celebrations. Right, armistice celebrations were an excellent way, of course, to spread um, uh, to spread the flu virus. Um, and so you have some doctors who are sort of seeing what's happening and saying, please, please do not, um, you know, cram onto trams um, and, uh, and go and celebrate. But of course, that, um, that, that didn't happen. So there's all, the, there's all of these sorts of overlapping things. But then I think that they are so distinctly different in terms of their mass death. And I think one of the things that really strikes me or struck me, um, and that links to our discussion of grief is, is that the, the war deaths, um, whether you agreed or disagreed with the war, um, it, there was a sense that a war death was sacrificial in nature, that, um, that you could say, this is a terrible, terrible tragedy, um, but, um, but my loss is, um, is uh, my son has died uh, to, keep the, uh, to keep the world safe. Um, and, uh, and that's a terrible thing um, to feel, um, but I think it's also a way of framing grief, right, and making sense of it and thinking, okay, that this mattered, right, this death mattered. Um, and of course, a lot of religious traditions have that sort of as a, uh, as a sort of cornerstone that, um, that the sacrifice of one would allow the health and well-being of others. And, um, and so, uh, but when the flu comes along, of course, there's no sacrificial model with which to treat the, uh, the flu deaths. Um, a flu death in the family um, only makes other flu deaths um, more likely. Um, there is no reason for the death. Nobody is better. Um, you, can't, you can't frame it within that sort of sacrificial model. And I think when faced with that, I think that we liked, it's, it's a, the human mind has a very difficult time um, sort of facing a death that we cannot explain within a story or explain with as some sort of, um, that, that there's no comfort there, right? There's no, there's no way to, to structure it. And I think that that was a really distinct difference that, uh, that, that, um, that really impacted the way the, the two events were treated and remembered. I think the other thing is that the, the war had been going on for four and a half years. People were used to it. They knew what it was. And it was also a masculine um, battle for power. You know, I mean, it was, uh, it was defined as something that was important, something historical, something that, um, that, uh, that everyone should be paying attention to. And I don't, I, I'm not questioning any of these things, um, um, absolutely. Um, all of those things were true, but uh, disease is uh, is so often um, gendered female um, as something that is a weakness, as something that is uh, that shows a kind of vulnerability, and um, and so people also ended up um, uh, uh, lying a lot, which I completely understand of where their relatives died, right, and how their relatives died, um, that, um, that they died in the war rather than having um, been killed from the flu. The flu was an everyday event. Um, most people even now have, um, have contracted the flu. 
at some point, and it's not usually dead. Well, it's often, it's much more deadly than people um, uh, imagine, but it's, um, and there was a sort of sense of shame. Um, there was also a sense, I would say, especially, um, um, I mean, less in, in the United States, but certainly in a lot of European countries, that it was disloyal to write about the pandemic. Um, that it was um, that here it, your country was losing all of these um, all of these young men, um, and uh, and how could your attention be um, be focused right on a, on a disease? Um, and the disease was uh, again familiar, and um, and the war well. Um, you know, well, we've had many, many wars, um, was a distinct sort of um, mode of fighting. So I think, and I think for listeners who remember how difficult it was in those early March days to figure out what story we were in and where we were in the story and, um, and how, how the paradigms kept shifting every day, that the things we thought were so could never happen one day, then we're just familiar the next day. I think when the flu came, people had spent these four and a half years fighting. They knew the stories. They knew what the fate of young men were, was going to be. They knew the fate of women. They knew who was in danger and who was not, where the front lines were, where the, the home front was. And, uh, and they, they knew that story, even if they hated it. But, um, but the flu then came with all of its different sort of suddenly women are in just as much danger as men. Suddenly the home front is as dangerous as the front lines, right? All of these stories that people had gotten used to just became disrupted overnight. And, uh, and I think people had a really hard time with that. Um, so those are just some of the, the sort of interactions. The, the, the war just kind of it, it overshadowed the flu, it, uh, it drowned it out. Um, I, I, I write in the book about Arthur Conan Doyle who had turned to spiritualism in his, uh, not after the war, it was, it was well before the war, but he really became famous um, after the war and the pandemic. And his, he lost many family members in the war, but his son is typically reported as having died in the war um, or from war injuries, but in fact, um, his son survived the war and his injuries, but died of the flu. Um, and so it's just a sort of good example of how people just couldn't, like the war was something they understood and the flu was just like some sort of bad plot device. Yeah, that, the Conan Doyle, I was really struck by that too. I mean, the, the story you tell of how Doyle himself describes his son as having died in the war. Um, and, you know, you can see that, as you say, the sort of masculine enterprise, even if many were disillusioned with the war by its end or by its middle or whenever you want to date that, it's still, you know, the big thing that societies do. They fight wars, they win them, people die in them, they make monuments. We know how to process this. And so, it was so striking to read that about that one particular case and of course many others. I think we should turn and talk a little bit about literature um, and about modernism. I'm sort of glancing at some of the questions as they're coming in and one of the early ones was asking about references to um, Into the Flu and Elliot Joyce Pounder Wolf and I thought, oh yes, she has many, <laughs> she has many things to say about those authors. Um, so, but maybe before we get to the author specifically, or really any way you feel like talking about this, um, you know, one of the, you were talking about all the ways that war is so visible. War is also visible because we as historians or literary critics or cultural critics make it visible. Um, and we, uh, many literary critics for the last 25 or 30 years have been very attuned to the presence of the war as a factor in shaping the literary culture of the era. It wasn't always true. And even something like The Wasteland, which you talk about, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which you talk about in great detail, um, he, and you note this in the book, kind of bristled at the suggestion that this was somehow a poem about the war. Um, and it wasn't really, it was read as a kind of general diagnosis of a post-war culture, but not specifically as kind of somehow detailing a war experience or, or even post-war per se. And that's something that critics have really brought to it. And so 
Um, I think that, you know, the, there is a sort of, you say a few times, you know, we have to look anew. Um, so I wanted to hear some of your, or to invite you to, to share with us some of your thoughts on how some of the very typical, or maybe not typical, but some of what you see as really important aspects of modernist literary form or modernist literature more broadly, um, how they look like what you call, you know, how, how you see the pandemic, how you read for the pandemic in them, or what that your knowledge, your sort of deep immersion in this series of experiences, personal and cultural of the flu, how you find that um, kind of uh, helping to shape form, or maybe you also say that modernism was really amenable to the flu because it was already interested in fragmenting things. It was always working around silences. Um, so can you share some of your feelings about the flu and modernism, um, either in general or in terms of some of these authors you talk about in the book? Yeah, sure. Um, the, um, one of the things I think that, that happens in this, uh, in this sort of post-pandemic era is that, uh, a, a, and modernist style, a lot of the things that we associate with modernist style is well um, underway, right, before the war, before the flu. So what it is that I'm talking about is the way that modernist style was sort of repurposed or retooled, right, um, and that it was in fact a very effective style to talk about something that was invisible and more amorphous and more like a climate or an atmosphere um, of, uh, of fear and anxiety and danger um, and that was fragmented and where the time was disrupted and, um, and, uh, and in terms of describing a kind of uh, actual physical delirium um, or a kind of post-war, post-pandemic innervation of the body, um, the modernism was, uh, was sort of beautifully positioned in, in so many ways to, um, to do that. And I think that the authors really um, that I talk about really draw on that, um, uh, draw on that. And one of the things I did in the, I guess, I guess I should back up one bit and say that one of the ways I started with this book was, was first discovering the, the casualty rates, which were 50 to 100 million globally died. Um, and then a half a billion people were infected. Um, and just knowing what we know about trauma and death, um, you can't have 100 million people die or 50 million people die without having it make an impact. And so that sort of started this mystery for me and this kind of hunt through, um, through literature that was very familiar to me and I taught many times, but, but sort of seeing it through this new lens. And, um, and so what I ended up doing in the book is first laying out a, a sort of sensory and uh, an emotional history of the pandemic. So there were things that show up over and over again, um, sensory sort of wise, what people were seeing and feeling and, and, and smelling and looking like and, uh, and hearing. Um, all of these sorts of things, the, the constant ringing of the bells and the terrible smells that the, that the body would give off and the way the body turned purple right before death and the floods of bleeding um, and the empty streets and the sort of post-pandemic sort of bodily enner innervation, right? Like uh, that, that, uh, that the, everywhere bodies were so, so tired. And, uh, and all of the orphans, you know, in New, in New York City, where, where Sarah is, there were 31,000 children were uh, lost one or both parents by November of 1918. Right? And so all of these sorts of, um, uh, all of these sensory experiences, all of these emotional experiences, I sort of give a history of that. And of course, modernism, but also literature more generally, is really good at telling those sorts of histories the history of the body and the history of emotions and the history of, of, of sensory sort of details. And when I went back and I read things like The Wasteland or um, Yeats's The Second Coming or Mrs. Dalloway, um, you start to see how much of that sensory and uh, 
emotional atmosphere is woven into these works. Um, I tried to be really careful in the in the book to not say that the um, to not treat the pandemic as the sort of the key to all mythologies, right? This is not the it's not true that the wasteland is really you know about the pandemic um, all along and not about the war. These are these are works that are about are incredibly rich um, uh, and are about so many different things. Um, but all of those authors, and there's, there's more in the book, but those, those authors right off the bat, Wolf and Elliot and Yates, all had really intimate encounters with the pandemic in a way that they did not have with the war. Um, they were all personally either um, uh, wolf, uh, wolf contracts the influenza during the pandemic, um, as, does, um, as does Elliot, um, and Yates' wife nearly dies um, uh, during the pandemic. Um, uh, of uh, of the flu virus, and so so I sort of looked at those um, that sort of that background, and I looked at the works that came out um, in the years um, after that, and uh, and it became clear to me that it was uh, that these were really extraordinary representations of the flu among many other things that they were doing, but the atmospheres, um, the bodily conditions, the, the aftermath of the flu. I think I had been teaching Mrs. Dalloway for you know, 15 years probably, and simply reading over the fact that she is recovering from influenza. And of course that book takes place in 1923, so maybe the influenza she's suffering from is not, uh, was not part of the pandemic virus. Um, but, uh, but Wolf's heart, her doctors thought were, was, was damaged by the flu as Mrs. Dalloway's heart um, is. And, uh, and so I just had read by it because, you know, we all had influenza. And, um, but then when you look at the way that that book is a portrait really of these two survivors, um, the Septimus Smith in the war and, um, and Clarissa Dalloway in the flu pandemic, right? And she's an older woman, so she would have had a better chance of surviving the flu than someone say like Septimus. Um, so, um, and, uh, but her body and her heart is still marked, right? Marked by this experience in a way that's difficult to see if you're not writing in a modernist style, right? Where you see at every point the way that the flu echoes through her body, right? As she's hearing the bells um, in, the, in the city, um, uh, echoing back to the constant bells during the pandemic. It's one, of the, it's one of the biggest things mentioned in letters about the pandemic is how oppressive the bells were because they were always ringing because so many people were dying. But she's hearing these bells and in the pause between the bells, she's thinking about her heart damage from influenza and, and, and sort of showing how that's a way that we remember disease, right? The way the body remembers, maybe not directly or fully consciously, but the way a long-term, a long illness can reverberate in the body and in memory um, really kind of requires a style like Wolf to show how it flies in and out of the mind and, um, and, and how the body's experiences then impact what Mrs. Dalloway sees um, on these streets of London. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really um, powerful. And I would just add the body and the mind. I mean, one of the parts of your book that I found really striking was your detailing of some of the psychic effects of the pandemic, which I think, by the way, is true of COVID as well. And I fear will be, as with the flu, um, underplayed in our sort of public health culture. Um, but you can start reading about this if you haven't yourself experienced it already. Um, but you have a really um, striking uh, photograph in the book um, of a monk painting, two monk paintings in which which are titled in Spanish, I think he calls it flu, flu or influenza or whatever it is. Um, and you know, this is in 1919, so, but we have this iconic idea of the scream as the painting that expresses modernist angst and the sort of psych the psychological um, you know, uh, realities of modernity. That's, that's what that painting, among other things, stands for. So 
to see the same painter with doing something not that dissimilar with the flu, I think really brought home how these two um, kinds of uh, trauma can be um, experienced in this double way. Um, are you, you know, I, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about some of those effects and, you know, just keeping my eye on the time. I also want to make sure that we talk a little bit about the, um, some of the more pop cultural, um, uh, you know, um, phenomena that you talk about, whether it's the vogue for spiritualism, which I, as a creature of my um, generation, had learned about in terms of the war, the rise in spiritualism and seances and the, all these different uh, desire, all, all these efforts to bring back the dead. Um, and you make the case really strongly that this is also, um, many of those dead were pandemic dead. And again, um, but then also the zombies and some of the kind of more filmic uh, representations of bodies coming back. So I want to make sure we get to that. But just quickly in terms of the psychological effects, um, sticking with sort of modernist form, I mean, how do you see the, the pandemic's effects on the mind helping to create a kind of modernist mindset that we might find familiar from other iconic representations, whether it's Monk or Joyce or somebody else? Mm -hmm. So I think that um, to answer it broadly, um, I think I'd want at this point to bring in um, sort of a PTSD um, sort of model in that um, in the, the, the one of the things that is happening after the pandemic and after the war and that sinks into modernism and that I think that we're already seeing with COVID is the way that all of these sensory triggers um, which are fragments, right? Fragments of the, um, of maybe the original sort of reminding you of, of, of parts of the original traumas or you know, smells and sights and sounds that have the power of bringing somebody right back to that initial experience. And, uh, and, yet, and yet it's fragmented, right? It's not, it's not full, it's not, um, it's not fully remembered or, 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 or necessarily processed. You know, you have all of these bodies suddenly terrified, but not knowing why, or that it's because they have seen or smelled or, um, or felt something that, that takes them back to, to uh, sort of a, a, a series or, or a specific traumatic event. And you have that, um, you have that in, in, in so much of the literature that is coming out of the uh, of the pandemic, and I think that we will we will see that. Um, I think we are already experiencing it. That sort of um, the uh, the things, and we we know that ten years down the road, um, sort of all of us will be marked by this experience, um, even if it's not full PTSD, but by being triggered back right by these uh, by these these sensory expressions. And then also the way this, um, and so sort of psychically, um, the way it will be hard for people to stop washing their hands, right? Or, um, or going into a movie theater without thinking about it or hugging somebody or all of these day-to-day -day things that we do um, are, going to, are going to have a residue right? Again, not necessarily fully conscious, but a kind of residue of anxiety and fear. And I think that's going to take a lot to process. Um, and then, of course, uh, I mean, I think this is something that art really does is, I mean, loss is loss, right? It's absence. It's, um, and there's a vertigo that goes along with that, right? Because there's no structure some, somehow, right? That the that the bodies that were here occupying this specific space are, are, are by definition no longer here, right? They are, they're absence, right? That's why loss and grief are so difficult to grapple with, well, among other things, that there's no structure for them. And I think that's something art can give us is some sort of structure for the loss. Um, I read um, in the book, uh, Time Passes, uh, uh, Virgi in Virginia Woolf, the Time Passes section, which is, seems to me such a, uh, a sort of tour de force of, of, of what we do with loss and absence. And as she describes, of, of clothes that were once occupied and are no longer occupied, right? They've collapsed. And anyone who has ever cleared out the closet of a, of a loved one who has died knows exactly what she's talking about there. 
And I think this sort of segues then into the, um, into what the popular culture was doing in terms of zombies and in terms of uh, spiritualism, this hunger to get bodies back, right? Not just a ghost of the body. I mean, one of the things that's really striking about spiritualism is how focused it, it is on the material return of the body. So not just a ghost, but a, uh, but, a, but a loved one who has died, who could tap you on the shoulder, who could tilt your table, who could, um, who could uh, produce ectoplasm, right? You have the Sorbonne studying ectoplasm very seriously in the 19, early 1920s. Um, and ectoplasm was, you know, supposedly the, the, um, the fluid, you know, that would, would come through um, uh, uh, in seances, um, the, uh, the medium's sort of nose or mouth. Um, and, uh, and that this was sort of tangible evidence that the loved one continued, right? And, uh, and that loved one was not in some sort of mass pandemic grave or in some battlefield who had never been found, but that had reconstituted itself, that, that body from all its fragments or disintegration and, uh, and come back to express to the person who was left behind a, a, a sort of um, actual tap on the shoulder. And I think that that was incredibly powerful and, uh, and gave people um, it gave people some hope, right? Gave people some, um, uh, a huge amount of comfort. Um, uh, uh, and was it, you know, did people get taken advantage of and was it fraudulent? Yeah, you know, of course it was. But, uh, um, but Arthur Conan Doyle, who was, uh, was not a fraud in that he really believed it. I mean, it, everything I, I read, he really believed it. He believed in spirit photography. Um, and which is where a, a ghost of a loved one would appear in a photograph. And, uh, and he was um, doing sold out lectures at Carnegie Hall sort of, um, and giving people this enormous amount of, uh, of comfort um, in the face of loss that was otherwise um, uh, unable to be processed, right? And unable to, uh, I mean, how we move on after a great loss and how you move on after the loss of so many in these years uh, of 1918. Um, cultures have to produce a way for people to get out of bed um, or they collapse. Um, and, uh, and spiritualism was one way. And, uh, um, and I think in potentially more destructive ways, uh, uh, zombies was, uh, was another, but, um, but I, will, I will stop there. <laughs> Leave that for an, another moment. Yeah, I mean, and you know, you mentioned people studying in the Sorbonne and um, Conan Doyle, it's lost on no one, the seeming irony of the person who's the creator of the hyper-rationalist, uh, you know, detective is also uh, the one who's seeking after these um, extra, um, you know, supernatural kinds of events. But it, it is really important to recognize in this period, and this goes back into the middle of the 19th century, really, but especially in this period, that this was a scientific I mean, it was a, a lot of things, but one thing it was, was the scientific inquiry. And there's the Society for the Study of Psychical Research, which had all of these famous uh, scientists involved and, and other, you know, kind of cultural luminaries. So there was a lot of authority um, associated with that and a lot of attempt to kind of meld scientific principles with this uh, search. Um, so I think that I've been kind of watching the questions as they come in. I wanted to sort of channel one or two of them into a, a question for you. Um, and we can kind of move that way. So I just invite, um, if you haven't already submitted a question through the Q&A and you'd like to do so, please go ahead. When they're really long, they're beautiful and interesting to read, but they're a little harder to, to grasp for me quickly. So um, just a word to the wise on that. Um, but I would say, you know, based on, there are two questions here that I think are getting at something really interesting from either ends of the um, chronological spectrum. Um, there's a question, um, which I also I was going to thinking of asking as one of mine about illness more broadly um, as a subject for literature as something that is, you know, part of the, you know, major experience of the human being and I'm the Dean of Humanities. So I think a lot about like, what are the humanities? What does it mean to do humanistic work? And one thing it means is to try to think about, you know, the ways in which human beings do and have engaged with their worlds and one of the primary factors in human experience over time has been illness. 
Um, so you have a question about other diseases in the later in the 20th century that you know are taken up by some of these authors. And Wolf herself, as you note, you know she she herself and and Clarissa in terms of that novel. Um, experienced flu at different times, not necessarily part of the pandemic, possibly. Um, but, you know, the flu is something that she lived with, that was part of her experience and not a, usually a very uh, happy way, um, a bodily experience, as we were saying, a psychic one. Um, and then there's another question about the 19th century and whether you see the kind of invisibility of the flu in the 20th century as being differentiated from what um, the writer of that question, uh, Diana Newby at Columbia, um, sees as a, a kind of a major subject for fiction, particularly for the novel in the 19th century. So kind of a question, I guess, about sort of illness and literature more broadly, you're not expected to answer for 100 years of all illness. But you know, you have thought and you talk in your book about some of these narratives, not only being about this pandemic, but more broadly. So if you wanted to think about those questions a little bit, that'd be great. Yes, those are, that is a lot of, um, that is a lot of history. So let me just say a couple of things there. One is the way that, um, just the, just to focus for a second on the word flu. And I think this was true um, in the 19th, 20th, and, and still true today if the emails from my students are any indication that Flu is both a specific term, right, for influenza, but then people use flu, um, and uh, and certainly Wolf did, and her doctors did, and uh, and Elliot did, as a sort of more general term of um, of illness, right? Sort of some illness that kind of um, uh, you know sort of wipes you out, right? So it's a it's a both a specific signifier and uh, and a vague sense of. Uh, 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 a vague sense of illness, which in some ways was part of how we missed the flu in modernism for um, for, for so long. I think that, um, you know, it, to look at the 20th century for a second and then to go back to the 19th, um, one of the things that struck me um, always as I was writing this book is, uh, is the, of course, this the, the AIDS pandemic, right? The uh, HIV AIDS pandemic which uh, has so far um, killed 40 million people and uh, worldwide and is, uh, and is ongoing. Um, and the way that that has um, woven its way far more directly into the literature um, where we get things like Angels in America and, uh, and also into memorials, right? It's one of the few pandemics that has actually been memorialized in the um, uh, if you think about like the AIDS quilt, like one of the most powerful art memorials um, ever made, right? Um, it is, uh, it's, uh, but it's one of the few diseases then that has a memorial, even if it's different than we might think of, uh, 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 of uh, in terms of a war memorial. But, um, um, and in terms of the 19th century, I think that there is there's a lot of attention to disease. Um, there is a lot of I mean, you think about tuberculosis, um, uh, and uh, um, uh, just just to take one, um, and the way that is that is figured is, is as Sontag sort of very famously um, very famously writes about. Um, and uh, I think that the the I guess that the and there's a lot of overlaps, right, in terms of the way disease is talked about, the way the disease is, uh, is sometimes experienced, um, grief, loss, all of these things that are, um, that are intrinsic to, um, to illness, the, the, the questioning of how one gets it or why one is in, uh, afflicted with something, right, that there's all of these things that, um, that overlap and I think that the, I guess that the difference would be the, the global scale, um, and certainly there's there's global pandemics, right, um, in uh, in the 19th century, um, but none that were even cl close to as deadly as um, as the influenza pandemic, and so that doesn't make it more important. Um, it just makes the sort of literary treatment, I think, um, different. Um, in terms of simply the sheer scope. Um, and people even at the time did understand how widespread the flu was, right? Even with a different set of communications, 
um, people knew that this was killing people across the globe. Um, and, um, and again, you have, you have so many pandemics though that are killing so many people. But I would say that that's, that's, some, of the, that's some of the difference. Um, that's a very broad answer, but... Uh, <laughs> it was a broad question, so <laughs> invited a broad answer. Um, it's so nice to see some friends um, on the screen. And we have a question from Mark Hussey, who, as you probably know, is an expert on Wolf. And um, she's thinking about um, the, com the conversations that went on between Wolf or among Wolf and her friends outside of their published um, literature in letters and elsewhere and noticing there as well a lot of silence about the flu um, and wondering is this is this repression then is this a question of repression is this a, a question of them sort of willfully wanting to not make this be the subject of their communications and of their thought um, you know do you have thoughts about that because one of the dichotomies one could draw is that privately people experience illness people experience this pandemic um, in all these ways that are enormously kind of overtaking even of their of their lives and of their bodies and of their minds. And then the literary output really either overlooks it or kind of fragments it and, and hides it. Um, so the question is, you know, in this in-between space of not the private sick room and not the published novel, you know, you read a lot of letters, you did a lot of archival work. I mean, it seemed to be kind of coursing through that set of archives you were looking at. So do you have thoughts on how some of these literary figures, even in this other kind of social dimension, wanted to minimize the flu? Or do you disagree with that, uh, that um, characterization? No, no I, I do. I mean, it does show up in the letters and the diaries. Um, uh, but I do think that if, um, if anyone besides me, I, it's been difficult with COVID to figure out exactly how freaked out one should be at any given moment, right? That's been very difficult to calibrate because nobody wants to be that person who's sort of, you know, the, the you know, we're getting a snowstorm and, uh, and, and goes out and, you know, stocks the fridge for five months, right? That sort of um, um, mentality. And I think especially for sort of intellectuals uh, in Wolf's circle, right? That kind of, any sort of hysteria, Right, um, like oh, this you know the flu is going to be uh, going to be terrible, and and Wolf you know directly mocks that um, and says you know the New York Times you know the, uh, the the London Times is saying that you know it's going to be like the bubonic it's like the bubonic plague, and she is really dismissive of that. Um, this is this is uh, this is early on, um, and I think that there is a way that people draw a sense of sophistication from and power from not being scared of something and displaying to themselves, to friends, to letters, uh, in letters that, that they're not scared. So Wolf is also mocking Lytton Strachey for uh, running away from London because he's so scared of the, um, because he's so scared of the flu. But then that shifts um, and, um, and you see in these, in these letters, you know, I'm speaking of Wolf here and diary entries, in the aftermath of her, of one of her flu cases, she does get the flu quite quite often. Um, but in the flu uh, case that seems to have damaged her heart, um, she's uh, uh, she's both sort of saying, um, you know, my pulses are insane, and sort of you know dismissing it and making light of it, but then also talking very seriously about how the impact on her work, how scared she is. Um, how much this is affecting her. So I think our sort of false fronts and our bravados and our trying to get right how scared we should be and how much we should meet that fear with a sense of pushing it away, right, rather than talking about it is all reflected in these, uh, in these, uh, uh, in this, in this private, uh, in this private writing um, that, uh, that goes on. And, um, and it's hard, of course, it's hard to admit fears and it's hard to admit weaknesses. Um, and I think especially for women writers, like Willa Cather has this um, issue, Catherine Ann Porter has this issue, right? As a woman writer, writing about disease, which is what you're, you know, certainly supposed to be writing about, you know, it's one of the acceptable topics, right, for women. 
and um, uh, and it it becomes uh, it becomes a sort of very thwarted endeavor, and uh, and I think this, for example, leads Willa Cather to um, to position the flu in her book, one of ours, which I talk about um, as a, as this sort of interim thing that interrupted the war briefly, but only took place kind of on this ship. Um, and uh, and it was uh, interfering with the um, with the real story, which which was of course uh, the war. So even as people saw the flu, the temptation to turn away from it personally and 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 culturally was pretty strong. Um, uh, I myself was not one of the people who wanted to watch Contagion um, uh, as uh, in March. Um, so it sort of depends on, on, on where your mindset is. Um, but I think a lot of people pushed it away because there's not much you can do um, besides, you know, wash your hands, wear your masks, people. I mean it. <laughs> there, um, I, we have maybe time for a couple more of these questions and maybe we'll end back with the present because we have a few questions about that. But a few of them have come in that are really right at the getting at the center of your book. One is about the wasteland per se and whether the burning, 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 burning is connected to uh, the flu. I know you have an answer to that. Um, and then a one, a kind of a general uh, question about the US and whether given that the flu rates, the flu mortality was so much higher for in the US than the war mortality, um, this, um, this questioner asks whether you see the Roaring Twenties as more of a response to the pandemic than the war. I know in general in the book, you try to steer away from more and less and sort of see them, as you said earlier, as overlapping. But you know, I don't know if you wanted to think about either the kind of specifics of the wasteland or the kind of general culture of the 20s in the US. You don't necessarily have to do both, but if either of those mm -hmm. you'd like to answer, and then maybe as a last question, we could go back to, to where we are now. Absolutely. So let me start actually with that last piece um, uh, and the, 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 the United States in the Roaring Twenties. Um, I, think, um, I think it was absolutely a contributing factor, right, the, uh, the pandemic. Um, and, I think that, um, and I think that we can see that sort of ever more clearly right now, right? Like what was the first thing people did in the United States, you know, poured out to bars, right, to beaches, right, to a way of sort of like, we've been cooped up for so long, we're gonna get out and we are going to, like we have been confronting our own mortality in the privacy of our own homes. And now we want to, um, to drown that out um, a bit. So I think you can sort of see, we'll never be able to sort of figure out exactly um, how those fit, but I think that, um, that it, it certainly did um, contribute to um, sort of, yeah. Yeah, contribute to it. Hold on, I've written something down and I can't see it. Um, the other thing is that I do, th the, the, in the book, the authors uh, that I talk about who talk about the flu directly, um, overtly, are all American authors. Um, in, and I'm just sticking to the interwar period. There's lots of things since then. But um, in the interwar period, I talk about uh, William Maxwell, Willa Cather, Catherine Ann Porter, and uh, Thomas Wolfe, and they are all American. And I do think that it is probably no accident that it was the Americans who felt like they could speak about the influenza directly since that it, the, you know, we only joined the fighting in 1917 and really not so much until 1918. And the war was, uh, was much farther away um, there's all sorts of differences between them, um, uh, uh, between those sort of, um, um, two coastlines there. Um, so then circling then back to the, to the wasteland, the burning, burning, burning. So I'm again, very careful in the book to not, um, to not, uh, to really stay away from author's intent. Um, and uh, as I think a lot of us are in our classrooms and to look uh, more at effect. Um, so did Elliot have his own flu case or the case of his wife in mind as he's writing burning, burning, burning? No, you know, no idea. Um, but does it evoke um, one of the things that people are talking about um, all the time in the influenza pandemic? Yes, right. This burning, the fevers were extremely high, right? And the way that that is structured um, um, is, uh, is so sort of delirium speak. 
right, a sort of, um, uh, and the ING form there, that sort of Jaren form that it's, it's going on again and again, it's very fragmented. Um, you sort of could see somebody kind of tossing and turning in bed. So again, it's not that necessarily Eliot is like, oh, I'm gonna put the delirium like right here in my poem consciously, but for the readers of the poem in 1922, um, uh, it, uh, it was in so many people's minds, right? So many, you have, again, a half a billion bodies who have experienced these fevers. This is something that is gonna resonate even if the reader um, themselves is not remembering that um, directly. That's great, I thank you. That's um, so just, I guess, uh, to, to, to bring this all, bring this all together, um, that's maybe a little much to ask, but um, we began the conversation talking about the present and it's been coming up obviously all along. Some of the early questions that came into the Q&A were about um, the similarities. Um, one person asked about so socially, I think presumably thinking about the kind of social politics of these. Um, and then there's an explicit question about the kind of political uh, dividing up um, that COVID is doing. I mean, it's Obviously, I don't, we don't need to spell that out in this um, format, but I guess the question there was whether you see um, similar sort of political um, consequences or ways of reading the response to the flu or people's, um, you know, you, you talked earlier about the kind of bravado response coming from the left of the left in the Bloomsbury group. So, you know, it's certainly not going to map clearly onto where we are today, but if you had thoughts um, on that, I think we'd like to hear them. And you know, if the politics aren't so interesting, if you wanted to make any final remarks about how you see some of the very varied, we should add, figures you talk about, ranging from um, more uh, sort of canonical modernist authors we've been mentioning to um, authors that are not usually read in that context. You have, um, and somebody asked about sci-fi, you have Lovecraft in your last um, chapter, you're looking at popular culture. So, you know, if you had some thoughts um, to close about sort of thinking about how these things work their way into the cultural narratives that in some ways can define a political moment or just a historical moment. Yeah, sure. Um, so we see some of the same tensions in that it was uh, generally the Sort of the business folks and uh, the church leaders um, uh, who were uh, advocating reopening. Um, that's not true for all all sort of religious groups. Um, uh, certainly, um, right now, but um, but that sort of the push um, uh, for for reopening that was countered by the public health officials and um, the doctors and the nurses. Right, the um, that sort of struggle. And I think that, um, I do think that it was, um, it was an era that was more, where the public good was more in the forefront of people's minds. Um, I think that um, people were much more used to in 1918, 1919, acting um, with communities um, uh, in mind, um, uh, the, the sort of the shaping of public spaces and the shaping of libraries. Now, m mind you that it uh, certainly in the United States that didn't include the whole public, right? It was, uh, these were extraordinarily segregated spaces for, uh, for example. Um, but this sort of sense that people would within communities and within neighborhoods um, um, help each other, make sure that people had enough to eat, um, I think was probably more prevalent than it is, at least in the United States right now. And the sense that that should be the goal of government, right? That government should be, um, you know, sh should be doing that. Now, government fell down in, in a whole range of ways in different places. Um, and um, so I'm not saying that it was uh, a paradise in 1918. It was absolutely not. Um, there was so, there was so much um, uh, inequality um, and, uh, and, and, bad, and bad politics. But I think in terms of the, the politics, which are always gonna come out in any kind of, um, in any kind of crisis, we're really um, pitting the war and the pandemic against each other um, and, uh, and accusing people of disloyalty if, again, they were paying attention to the pandemic versus the, 
um, versus the war. So those sorts of politics were, um, uh, were everywhere. Um, it's just that now the politics are sort of, uh, uh, we, have this, we have this COVID crisis and it's within that. Though, again, in the United States with these really very, very important protests that have been going on, um, that has that has uh, led to a, a, a sort of um, uh, a different sort of sense of political split, and that's a, a huge topic that um, um, uh, that we're going to have to be spending a lot of time sort of writing about these uh, these sort of two events in the uh, in the United States. Um, I think. You know, I really hate to end with Lovecraft because, uh, and, I, and, I, and I know that I'll be maybe offending some people here, but uh, I just, um, it, was the, it was the part of the book I, I enjoyed the least um, researching. Um, but I think he is a, actually a, a very good figure to think through all of the dangers that, um, that face us now and in the coming months in the way that he took this sort of widespread sense of contagion um, and uh, an infection and mapped it onto his own um, racism, xenophobia and homophobia, right? That he is, he is mapping and, and collapsing the two and sort of saying, this, um, this is, um, they're all of a piece, right? And we see, of course, the Nazis do this, um, that, uh, that we have to, you know, cut out this group like a cancer or a disease, right? But I think that any time these disease metaphors stop being metaphors of disease and start being applied to groups of people, and we've already seen this, right, on um, the, uh, the, um, the attacking, um, in the United States of Asian Americans um, or anyone of Asian descent, right? The blaming of whole groups of people and saying these are, these are diseased people, right? Um, uh, immigrants, right? Who are coming in, right? That those are, that's the vector of infection. All of this kind of language, I think um, uh, shows up very much in 1918. And I talk about it in the book through Lovecraft um, but also is showing up again. Um, and I think that this is, uh, these are, you know, the angels of, uh, th these are the, uh, our worst, our, our, our worst sides. And, uh, and I think, again, when you have an invisible enemy and you want to make it visible, uh, the temptation can be to, um, to scapegoat uh, in these ways that are, are, are deeply damaging and, uh, and life-threatening. And I think the more that we can push away from that and towards this sense that we have, um, we have a threat um, that faces us all, um, but that faces certain communities far more um, uh, uh, is something that, uh, that's, that we should be um, sort of zeroing our focus in on how we can, um, how we can mitigate those threats um, and, uh, and and stop the, um, the massive amount of, of, of losses. And the United States could start by having everyone wear masks when they're outside. Um, I think that that, in terms of um, paying attention to the public good um, and preventing other people from experiencing a loss that is uh, not, that, that from which one cannot recover, um, uh, the mask is a, is a, is a great, practical tool and also a symbolic representation of how we might care for each other. Sounds like a very good um, ending point. Um, so I, I, you know, Zoom meetings are deeply unsatisfying in the kind of leave meeting as our salutation, but you can all in your private rooms join me in thanking Elizabeth Outka for writing this beautiful book. Um, and for talking about it with us today. Good. Um, thank you all for coming and, uh, and I'm happy to answer additional questions um, by email. Okay. Take care.
you both. And thank you, Sarah, so much for, um, I should just, yeah, let me end there to thank Sarah so much for these wonderful questions and for agreeing to lead this um, at, uh, in the middle of an unbelievably busy time for you. And, uh, and to thank um, everyone in, uh, uh, in, in Paris and the Columbia um, uh, group for, um, for setting this up. Um, um, Joelle, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's really been a pleasure. It was a pleasure for us as well. Thank you. And I am just so everyone knows, a video recording of this will be available on our YouTube channel and we'll share it with you as well if you want to share with your networks. Thank you again. Thank you. Good night.